a little bit about stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation today. Um, I had to change the date of the slide by one uh, to update it from last year. Uh, I do have disclosures, and actually there's one that's not on here. Uh, so I, uh, I'm the director of the Analytic Center for the ACC, and one of the registries that we get paid to analyze is the left atrial appendage occlusion registry, which is relevant for this talk. I also hold stock in Medtronic, maker of cardiovascular devices, although not in this space at the moment. And I am the PI on, on a clinical trial, the Champion AF trial, that's going to talk a little bit about it in this talk. Um, that's uh, randomizing patients at low risk to Watchman versus a DOAC. All right, so as way of background, um, and this is going pretty far back, uh, the rates of atrial fibrillation in the United States and in the world are increasing in a function uh, that is directly proportional to the aging of our population. So in uh, 1995, from the estimates, I think this is from NHANES data, um, the, uh, the proportion of patients with atrial fibrillation, or sorry, the, the, the total population is about 2 million. And we're right at the start of this inflection point that as the, the population is aging relatively rapidly with declining birth rates and increasing longevity. Uh, so we're now estimated to be about 3.3 million. And by 2050, uh, by which time I will be very retired, uh, the, the rate will be about five to 6 million. Uh, so this is an increasing epidemiological issue. Uh, the association between atrial fibrillation and risk of stroke has been well studied. Um, perhaps one of the more foundational studies was from Framingham, uh, which identified atrial fibrillation at all, not, not stratified by underlying risk factors or anything like that, but atrial fibrillation at all give you a five times risk of stroke at two years, um, and certainly a higher risk for uh, for stroke than traditional risk factors like coronary heart disease or, or high blood pressure, things like that. So number one, it's increasingly common. Number two, um, it's a very large risk factor for, for one of the major sources of morbidity and mortality in the country. So why is uh, left atrial appendage relevant uh, to the discussion? Well, certainly uh, there are studies and I have not actually gone back to read this study, but I, I feel like I should go back and study this a little bit more. Um, but the dogma is that greater than 90% of left atrial thrombi in non-valvular atrial fibrillation occur in or originate in the left atrial appendage. And the rationale for anticoagulation that I'll go through is that we're just going to thin the blood everywhere. It doesn't matter where the clots would form. But if we're going to focus on a particular area of the left atrial appendage, um, we really need to target, I'm sorry, the left atrium, we need to target the place where strokes might uh, originate from or thrombus might originate, and that is the left atrial appendage is the contention. Um, so just to restate it one more time, AFib, most common cardiac arrhythmia, growing prevalence in population, AFib increases your risk of stroke five times compared to patients without atrial fibrillation. Uh, not all patients with atrial fibrillation are equal risk of stroke, and um, for better or worse, the chads 2 vast score has uh, seen an ascendance and is really the only score that's utilized in routine clinical practice for risk stratifying uh, patients underlying risk of, uh, of thromboembolic stroke and the associated uh, need for anticoagulation. And there really only, you know, there's thousands of risk scores out there. There are really only two that I think people have really caught on. Um, I'd argue the, the, the Timmy risk score for stratifying acute coronary syndromes and the CHAD2 VAS, those are uh, things that are A, easy to remember, uh, and B, uh, things that are associated with uh, helping us easily decide between treatment therapies. So intervention or no intervention in the case of the Timmy risk score, um, which has two vast anticoagulation or no anticoagulation. Um, but it is really pretty remarkable that despite the simplicity of the score, it is really associated with a monotonic increase in stroke risk um, as you go from a risk score of zero up to, to nine. And uh, current clinical guidelines would endorse the use of CHADS2-VASC uh, to stratify patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. 
Uh, so the 2014 guidelines, and I don't think these have been updated, uh, recommend anticoagulation, either warfarin or a DOAC um, for patients with CHADS 2 vascular greater than equal to 2. Uh, the ESC guidelines, I believe, are still relevant, um, but endorsed a lower threshold of anybody with a CHADS 2 vascular greater than equal to 1 as being recommended for oral anticoagulation. So there's a little discordance, but a consistency once you get above a CHADS 2 vascular 2. So warfarin certainly uh, remains very commonly used, albeit uh, I think for the first time, I think the inflection point was about two years ago where more DOAX were used than, than warfarin for treatment of non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Um, as this slide illustrates, there is a relatively narrow therapeutic window for, for warfarin. Uh, so the black line there represents the risk of ischemic stroke. Um, you can see that it really starts to plateau somewhere around two to two to three, and then is relatively uh, similarly uh, flat after that point, whereas the risk of uh, intracranial bleeding is plateauing somewhere in the two to three range and then increases dramatically as you get above three. So narrow therapeutic window, albeit certainly has been shown to be beneficial. Um, all the, the DOEX um, have a in, uh, on mass been shown to be beneficial uh, in terms of compared with warfarin for the treatment of non valvular atrial fibrillation. Um, series of, of meta-analyses and meta-regressions uh, demonstrated pretty consistently and clearly um, that it is both uh, beneficial in terms of uh, re uh, reducing the risk of ischemic events or ischemic strokes, and that's illustrated in the top panel there. But in the bottom panel, and this is fairly unique in, in most of our clinical trials is that it's dominating, right? It's reducing both your ischemic stroke as well as reducing your overall risk of, of bleeding. And again, also in this slide demonstrating that it's reducing the risk of uh, intracerebral, intracranial bleeding as well. So all things being equal, uh, DOEX seem to be favored over warfarin for both safety and efficacy. And I think that's why we've seen the change in clinical practice towards widespread adoption of DOEX. Um, this is really important to keep in mind when you consider the potential role of Watchman device, uh, because the Watchman was really only uh, considered in randomized trials compared with warfarin, and as yet has not been compared against a DOEX. And so it's an open question as to how relevant our findings and our extrapolation of the data from these clinical trials is to an era where the majority of our patients are being treated with DOEX. So keep that in mind as I go through the rest of the talk. Here. Um, so bleeding certainly is the, the biggest concern that, that we have for patients with atrial fibrillation uh, who are considered for anticoagulation therapy. There is a lesser used score, but still this is the one that, that's uh, incorporated into guidelines and the one that's being incorporated into uh, coverage decisions by CMS. Um, it's the HasBlood uh, score. So it takes relatively simple clinical factors, hypertension, renal and liver function, stroke, bleeding, labile INR, uh, age, and need for antiplatelet therapies. Um, or NSAIDs, and it sort of factors those into a score analogous to the uh, chads 2 vas score. And similarly, there is a risk stratification such that the higher your has blood score, the higher your underlying risk of bleeding on anticoagulation. Um, and the inflection point here is sort of arbitrarily drawn, but seems to be at about two. So your, your risk of bleeding uh, per 100 patient years is twice that if your score is two than if it's zero or one. So the major issue with anticoagulation is um, the inability to place or keep people on anticoagulation. And in this study of uh, atrial fibrillation patients, um, I think they had a, a registry where they looked at uh, patients who weren't enrolled and the reasons why they weren't enrolled uh, relevant to not being able to take oral anticoagulation. And so this is sort of a snapshot of a trial of population. So they're probably a little bit different than, than most of our patients that are seen or may not be representative. But among these 10,000 patients, 13% uh, had a contraindication of some sort to oral anticoagulation, and they're listed on, on the right there. But the largest one uh, was bleeding and preference, the largest two were bleeding and preference. And that's very similar to what we see, at least in the subpopulation of patients that I evaluate in the left atrial appendage occlusion clinic. Uh, where prior bleeding is the, by far and away the, the largest reason for referral to us. 
Okay, but even in, you know, despite that, uh, there are other barriers to getting and keeping people on oral anticoagulation. So this is data from the Pinnacle Registry, which is sort of uh, auto, uh, data automatically being extracted from outpatient EHRs of cardiology practices, and looking actually cardiology and non-cardiology practices, and looking at among patients with atrial non-valvular atrial fibrillation, stratified by their chads to vas score on the x-axis, uh, whether or not and what they were taking for stroke prevention. So it's a little bit of a complex slide, so I'm just gonna take a few seconds to walk through it. So the most concerning piece is the top line, sort of the pale blue at the top. Um, and you can see that about 20% of patients, irrespective of your chance to vest score, uh, were not taking anything. So there are no antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulation therapy. Another 20%, roughly, across sheds to vest scores were just taking aspirin. So right off the top there, um, even if we're restricting just to the sheds to vest scores of two or more, about 40% of our patients aren't being treated chronically with appropriate anticoagulation therapy. And again, that slide before illustrates some of the many reasons why patients don't take oral anticoagulation, but it is problematic. This data is a little old, probably, I think it ended in 20. 14, right? So DOACs were pretty new at that point. Um, so the majority of patients had been on warfarin at that time, with a relatively small number of patients on the, on the direct acting agents. And even if we do get our patients on oral anticoagulants, we're not terribly good at maintaining them on that. So this, uh, this data shows uh, persistence of therapy um, with a blinding of about two months after the initiation or the initial prescription of, uh, of NOAX versus Coumadin. And what you can see is that uh, Coumadin therapy, the, the persistence rates are very low. So about 50% of patients at two years are still taking Coumadin therapy. Um, if you start a NOAC therapy as your initial strategy here, the persistence rates are a little bit higher but still about 30% of patients aren't taking a NOAC at two years after the initial prescription. So we're not, you know, if you take a snapshot, a lot of our patients aren't taking anticoagulation. If we follow them over time, a lot of our patients are being taken off anticoagulation. And we have to assume that in many cases, there are good reasons for that, uh, but there are probably also some systematic ones, including the, the cost of therapies, the invasiveness of the monitoring, of Coumadin at least, um, and uh, probably other ones that I can't think of right now, but this is very common for, you know, these, these lines look the same for pretty much every therapy that we, that we prescribe. So ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, um, P2Y12 inhibitors, it, uh, the ability to, to encourage our patients to be compliant with medications is pretty dismal. So what are the alternatives to oral anticoagulation? Um, and the good news is that there are some. Uh, the bad news is that most of them are, are ineffective, at least the ones that are used. So I mentioned that about 20% of patients uh, in that study from Pinnacle were not taking anticoagulation, but they were taking aspirin or aspirin and a P2Y12 inhibitor. Um, and there's just not a lot of evidence to suggest that, that it's actually improving uh, outcomes. So I would say that, um, that my best estimate of the, the totality of evidence around aspirin for atrial fibrillation stroke reduction is that it's probably making us feel like we're doing something without actually it being effective at all. So I think it's a, it's a false sense of security that it's giving us. In contrast, uh, there is left atrial appendage closure, which um, has increasing evidence, and it's, I think probably more evidence in its favor than that there is for aspirin alone. Um, and there are, of course, two ways to do this. It can be done surgically, generally, uh, very rarely as a standalone procedure and much more often associated with concomitant cabbage or valve surgery. I'll come back to that a little bit later in the talk. And then there is the rise of, of percutaneous uh, left atrial appendage closure, um, either endovascular techniques with the Watchman device, on plots or wave crest. Um, or epicardial, uh, which at this point I think is still limited to the lariat suture ligation, which uh, from an editorial side, I think is still a crazy procedure, albeit it can be done. Um, so what's the evidence for surgical clipping? Uh, so some of the evidence came from a study that Dan Friedman published a few years ago while he was at Duke, uh, where he looked at data from, I believe, the STS registry and found patients with atrial fibrillation 
uh, who were or were not uh, treated with a surgical ligation or atrial clip device. Um, and what he found after doing appropriate matching and, and adjustment for residual confounding to the extent that he could, is that the patients with the surgical ligation or, or left atrial appendage closure um, did much better from the standpoint of readmission for stroke or systemic embolism, all-cause mortality, um, similar rates of, of hemorrhagic stroke, which is the hardest thing to, to explain, um, but that overall surgical ligation of the appendage seemed to be beneficial in this population of patients. Um, and I didn't pull in the slide, but there was a recent uh, study uh, that conducted a randomized trial of of uh, closure or occlusion of the left atrial appendage versus uh, medical therapy among patients undergoing concomitant surgery that showed uh, confirmation of Dan's findings in that it was beneficial in terms of reducing risk of stroke and I believe death out to three years. So in a nice case of the, the observational data predicting what the randomized trial showed, which isn't always the case. So that's a, sort of the end of the background of the talk um, in terms of like the why of it. And I'm just gonna go through now more of the how we do it uh, and then come back a little bit to the evidence that supports what we're doing as well as future directions. So the only current FDA approved device uh, for left atrial appendage closure is the Watchman device manufactured by Boston Scientific. Um, this uh, picture, these pictures show uh, the first commercially available, first generation commercially available device, which was the 2.5. Um, and it's kind of a cleverly engineered uh, device. It is a nitinol frame that has um, barbs. Let me see if I can get my mouse to work. So barbs lined across the base of it. And then the surface of it, it has a PTFE uh, covering. Um, and then the little shiny part up there is the knob that allows the, the screw in that, that we actually allows us to deliver and then ultimately is released when we uh, finally leave the device behind. Um, and the goal, and this is sort of the schematic that shows an optimal implantation, uh, but the goal is to implant it into the left atrial appendage so that there's no leak, so that there's a firm seal on all sides of the device and that there's good compression and anchorage so it's not going to migrate anywhere. So that's sort of what we're shooting for. And the important thing, and this is always hard for patients to understand, is that it's not immediately effective, right? So it, the, the fabric is actually porous, blood can get through it, albeit slower than normal. Um, but the risk of, of in the thrombogenicity of the device um, is actually increases probably your risk of, of stroke, ischemic strokes in the very short term after device placement, unless you're on appropriate anticoagulation therapy. Um, the thought is that by day 45, at least in canine models, and, and so far supported in the few human studies that are out there, uh, that eventually this device will be endothelialized and uh, that there will be no communication between the left atrial appendage and the body of the left atrium by about 45 days. So that informs our strategy for how we take care of these patients and that we do the implantation, we maintain them on some form of anticoagulation or dual antiplatelet therapy for at least 45 days if possible. Then we repeat the transesophageal echocardiogram at 45 days to assess for position and leak specifically. And if it meets our criteria, we then take them to dual antiplatelet therapy for another four and a half months followed by uh, monotherapy with aspirin after that lifetime. Um, but that first 45 days, um, and perhaps even a little bit longer than that, there is risk of device thrombus, um, which can be problematic or certainly can, can theoretically um, result in, in risk of uh, systemic embolization or stroke. So I'm just gonna show this uh, industry sponsored video for a second that kind of shows the, the major steps in how we do the, the deployment. Um, so we obtain access in the femoral vein, we run our uh, SL1 catheter up into the right atrium to do our transeptal puncture. Um, usually that's fairly routine, kind of do a mid and uh, inferior uh, location in the fossa. We then have our access sheet, which we redirect to allow a pigtail to atraumatically enter the appendage and then follow it with the access sheet. And then we do a release or a deployment of the device. And if we like it, we release and it becomes permanently implanted in. 
And ideally by 45 days out, it is endothelialized and the patient is now protected against atrial appendage related risk of stroke. So relatively fast, but I think it gives you a sense of, of the steps that we go through as we're doing the device. So how do we know if it's uh, gonna be a successful device or if, if we're gonna actually release it? So there are um, the things you worry about, you know, really, is it gonna form a good seal and is it gonna stay in place? And so it's been simplified to these past criteria that the uh, clinical leads from the company make us go through formally at every implantation. So first we look at the position. Is it appropriate? Is it too deep into the uh, appendage? Where, where there may be unprotected trabeculations, or is it too shallow? Is it sticking out? Is there a shoulder that might uh, increase the risk of embolization? Second, we look at the anchorage and uh, assess whether or not the barbs are suitably engaged into the wall of the appendage, and that is what provides most of the stability of the device. We do that by performing a tug test or multiple tug tests where you're looking not so much for does the device move when you pull on it, but does it spring back into place once you release it? Uh, third criteria is size, and that's compression. Uh, for the 2.5 device, we, the acceptable range of, of uh, compressions was 8 to 20 percent uh, in multiple views. And uh, with the Flex device, which is the device that's now being commercially used most, um, it's a little bit more stringent where uh, the, the minimum compression is, needs to be 10%, and I think the max is 20 or maybe 25% will accept occasionally. Um, and the, the goal on that is that there does seem to be a higher risk of, of device migration or embolization. Uh, so we want to be a little bit more stringent that the device is being compressed, which uh, it's, would help us feel confident the anchors are suitably embedded. And then we look at seal. Is there going to be a leak? And this is probably one of the more controversial areas of, of where we should be setting the bar. Um, the FDA approval will allow us to accept a up to five millimeter leak at the time of implant or at the 45 day TEE and say, it's okay to come off anticoagulation at that point. That's based off of relatively uh, small amounts of patients. Um, and so it's really more of a arbitrary number than something that is driven by science. Do a time check if we're doing okay here. Okay, so um, what does this look like? So, you know, there's the schematic that I showed you, and then there's reality. Um, most of this procedure, at least in our experience, is still being guided by transesophageal echocardiogram. A number of centers have uh, switched either partially or entirely to ICE uh, to sort of guide the deployment and the assessment of the, the seal and, and compression. Um, we're starting to play with that, but we haven't really done any ice guided therapies. We've used it as an adjuvant imaging, uh, not, not standalone. Um, but the goal is really that you have it at the ostium of the appendage, that you have it as flush as possible. Uh, and you're looking at it in multiple views to make sure that, that it's not tilted in any one uh, particular view. So for the size, as I mentioned, we want compression, uh, usually in the 10 to 20% range now for the flex device. Um, and it's a very simple calculation that we're measuring through the pin to get a uh, minimal, I'm sorry, to get the diameter uh, through the pin at the shoulder here. Um, and then we compare it to what the device should be. So um, the you know, device previously came in 24, 27, 30. Now it's 20, uh, 24, 27, 31, and 35 with the newer flex device. Um, but we're just doing a simple calculation to measure compression in multiple views again. And it's all about having multiple views to make sure we're evaluating this ovoid uh, appendage opening, um, making sure we're not missing anything. Uh, for seal, we're using Doppler and basically, again, doing it in four or five different angles to assess whether or not there's leak around the device or less frequently through the device if there's a perforation of the fabric. And what does this look like on ECHO for us? So this is our baseline ECHO images. Uh, we see the appendage with uh, fairly prominent trabeculations. And I think this is more of what we call a windsock. The, the notable thing is that the appendage comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And we have a, a fun time trying to name them, the, like the lobster claws or the hammerheads and things, piece of broccoli. Um, chicken wings are probably the hardest because the angulation of it make it hard for us to deliver our equipment, but that's a little bit less of a consideration with the, the flex device. 
So here's the sheath, uh, the excess sheath uh, in the appendage itself. Um, shows you kind of like how deep we have or have to go or had to go previously with the 2.5 device. The nice thing about the flex device, I'll come back with this, has opened up a lot of, of appendages that we couldn't otherwise have treated in that um, you don't have to have as, get the catheter as deep as, as previously. So on the left screen you have, uh, we do adjuvant um, injections to sort of confirm what we think is the anatomy. Um, we can see that actually this, uh, uh, floor, uh, this I don't know, appendagogram uh, demonstrated that there was a little bit more complex anatomy than we thought, um, but does confirm that there is a fairly proximal lobe that we weren't sure if we were ever actually be able to cover that and demonstrates the mitral runoff there. Here's the on the right side is after we've done our deployment, but the device is still tethered by and, and on its leash. It hasn't been released, as we call it. Um, it's showing that the appendage is pretty well situated. We oftentimes use the circumflex artery as a, um, a nice landmark to say, are we close to the uh, osteum of the appendage? So then we, we were satisfied. We did our tug test. We looked at our compression. And we look for a leak. And in this case, there is no leak around the device. We confirm that again by angiogram. You can see that the, the dye gets through the fabric, but it sort of hits the face, spreads out, and then goes through. So that's sort of an acceptable uh, amount of speed by which the contrast is getting through the fabric. So that device we did release successfully. Um, and I think we're up to about 240 implants. I think we're averaging somewhere 10 to 14 a month at this point with a little break for, for COVID in the middle there. So what's the data? Uh, and we go probably spend the rest of the talk on sort of what's the data for it and a little bit about our research program uh, using data from the registry. Um, but I would say, you know, like, like many devices, um, it, there's not a ton of data on it. Um, and there really are only two clinical randomized trials non-blinded uh, that enrolled patients and randomized them to warfarin versus a, uh, a Watchman implantation. And if you look at the timing, it shows you um, some of the struggles that Boston Scientific had taking this from uh, the, the initial designed pivotal trial to clinical approval by the FDA, which really only happened, I believe, in March of 2015. So it was, I, I don't actually know, and, and Alexander probably knows a lot better than me, what the average duration of time for a novel technology like this, um, but certainly I think it was much longer than, than much longer road than what they initially anticipated. Um, but the two randomized trials were Protect AF and Prevail, and they both had associated continue access protocol registries um, that sort of gives us a few more patients, albeit in a non-randomized context. Uh, both of the randomized trials uh, did it in a uh, two to one uh, strata for randomization and follow patients for um, at least two years and up to actually now five years for uh, Protect AF and Prevail studies. But relatively small numbers of patients total, like 800 for Protect AF, 460 for, for Prevail. Procedural success rates um, are actually quite high but then increased over time. Uh, so if you look for the initial uh, study, um, the Protect AF uh, of those, 450 patients randomized to device, success rates were about 91%. That improved over time. Again, this is all with the first generation 2.5 device um, and uh, demonstrated increase in, in success rates up to about 95% fairly consistently. And then in the post-approval uh, registry-based analysis, the success rates incorporating a whole host of new operators, people for whom this was a new approach, again, maintained a 95% success rate. Uh, we're uh, locally right at that number. Um, there's still a few patients, even with the flex device, that you can't get a good, a good uh, seal and fit. And so um, we do quote people about a 4% uh, failure rate. The big issue with, with the randomized trials uh, was a lot about the procedural safety. And so in the initial trial, um, the rate of pericardial tamponade was about four and a half percent. The rate of procedure related stroke was about one percent and the rate of device embolization was a little less than 0.5 percent. So, you know, pretty significant rates of adverse outcomes for what some might argue is a relatively um, elective procedure um, and that these, I think, randomized in this, these trials were patients who could have continued to be on long-term uh, oral anticoagulation. 
Um, some of the explanation uh, for the high rates of, of pericardial tamponade was that they actually didn't, hadn't adopted the technical approach of engaging the left atrial appendage with the pigtail and then atraumatically railing in the access sheath over the pigtail catheter. Um, once we adopted that technique, not we, but they, um, then the, the rates of pericardial, pericardial tamponade requiring intervention came down, albeit we're still significant. So even in relatively experienced hands, um, the rates were around a little less than 2%. Um, and about 1% in the initial US uh, registry experience. Stroke similarly, uh, relatively high in the first trial with what some evidence of, uh, that it has declined over time. This is impaired procedural ischemic stroke. Um, a lot of these in the initial trial were based on air embolism, um, which uh, was attributed in part to interventional cardiologists not being familiar with working in the left atrial appendage, which I take issue with, um, but probably had more to do with preparation of the device and the attentiveness to removing all air from the device prior to inserting it into the body. But similar to the story with the tamponade, um, the, the rates of paraprocedural stroke have gone down and now um, are kind of vanishingly small in, in the more recent experience. And I'll, I'll show the larger registry experience towards the end of the talk here. So in terms, so that's sort of the safety side of things. Um, in terms of the efficacy side, um, the uh, the reduction of of all stroke, or sorry, the rates of all stroke in patients randomized to Watchman compared uh, with warfarin therapy uh, were similar or not significantly different. Um, if you look at individual types of strokes, there were some signals suggesting that there are trade offs. So the risk of hemorrhagic stroke was statistically significantly reduced in patients randomized to the Watchman device, um, but there did seem to be a slight increase in the risk of non-procedural ischemic strokes, um, such that, that uh, I think it was borderline significant, but certainly favored warfarin over the Watchman device for ischemic strokes. Um, interestingly, and I've never seen a really good explanation of why, um, but cardiovascular death rates were lower in the Watchman device compared with the warfarin uh, patients. Um, for all-cause death, there was no statistically significant uh, difference. Um, and major bleeding overall, including paraprocedural bleeding, did not uh, favor device versus warfarin. When you kind of put this into context of all the different uh, randomized and non-randomized uh, registry-based uh, studies, um, the rate of ischemic stroke uh, was well below the predicted rate based on patients' CHADS-2 VAST scores. Now, you have to take that with a grain of salt because it's comparing to not even historical control, but a calculated estimate. Um, but it certainly suggests that there is at least some protection being provided by the Watchman device in terms of reducing the risk of ischemic strokes. And there is, uh, again, some evidence to suggest um, that the, uh, there is risk of a reduction of non-procedural bleeding over time. And the expectation is that these curves would continue to diverge um, if you extended beyond the five years of follow-up that they had. But what they did here is they did two landmark analyses, the first at seven days uh, to six months. And this is the time period in which patients would still be taking either uh, oral anticoagulation plus aspirin versus DAPT after the, the first 45 days. Um, and not surprisingly, we see pretty similar rates of, of bleeding in the uh, device and, and warfarin arms. And then they did the landmark as to what happens when the patient then goes down to just a baby aspirin at six months versus continued warfarin therapy. And that's where the curves really start to, to uh, uh, separate and that you're seeing a 72% relative risk reduction in the risk of major bleeding after six months post-procedure. So I referred to this earlier, um, but there uh, certainly was a rocky road uh, and a long time lag from inception uh, for the first, uh, first in-person in studies in 2002 to the initiation of the PROTECT AF uh, trial in 2005, and really only getting to FDA approval in, in March of 2015. The first uh, FDA panel raised a lot of concerns about device safety based on those paraprocedural complication rates that I showed you uh, related to the PROTECT trial. Uh, that led to 
a mandated second randomized trial, the PREVAIL, which was designed to look at complication rates in a little bit more detail. Um, and that actually raised a second issue in that it did show that the complication rates were lower and now acceptable with the new, new techniques. Uh, but then it showed uh, it did not meet the non-inferiority for reduction of the primary endpoint, including ischemic stroke. So you kind of have one trial that showed efficacy, but a safety signal. You had a second smaller trial that showed no safety signal, but suddenly a concern about the efficacy. Uh, so that led to a fairly contentious FDA approval process, um, but one that actually led to uh, the mandating of a post-approval study, uh, which is the U.S. nested NCDR LAO registry uh, study that, that Boston Scientific supports, uh, which is in embedded within the larger registry that was mandated by CMS requiring submission of information about all Watchman cases to the, F, uh, sorry, to the registry, um, which then ports out data to CMS to assess compliance with the coverage decision. So this uh, shows the, the deep, you know, a broad overview of the, uh, the coverage decision by CMS. Um, so there's some patient criteria and then their provider and hot facility criteria. Um, but they kind of did something, they approved it in a slightly unusual factor um, in a way that wasn't completely consistent with the randomized trials. So what they state is that all eligible patients must have suitable risk of thromboembolic stroke, so chance to vask of greater than two for, uh, for men and greater than three for women. Uh, the patients must be suitable for short-term warfarin, but deemed unable to take long-term anticoagulation which is fairly nebulous, um, but basically saying, we don't think it's equivalent to warfarin. We think it really should be reserved for patients who have a pretty good reason not to take uh, long-term oral anticoagulation. Uh, uh, and then finally, as documenting just how they're suspicious of how this would be rolled out into clinical practice, documented evidence of a formal shared decision interaction between the patient and an independent non-interventional physician using an oral uh, anticoagulation evidence-based decision tool, right? And so a lot of words in there, um, but basically saying, we don't trust that you're putting this information to patients in a fair way. So we need a neutral third party to have that discussion to make sure that they're going into this with their eyes open and aware of all potential options for them. So this is one of a few times that, they've, that CMS has done this. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the goal is other than to kind of exert some downward pressure on the adoption of the technology. Um, uh, and to be honest, I think most sites, ourselves included, are obeying the letter of the law, um, but hard to say if we're really uh, engaged in the spirit of what they intended this to, to represent. So other criteria, uh, again, the formation of the left atrial appendage occlusion registry. Uh, the ACC registry is the only one that's currently approved by, by CMS for this purpose. Um, then operator requirements. And this is, I think, uh, reasonably important, particularly for trainees as you're thinking about what types of training to obtain. Um, so either IC or EP or cardiovascular surgeon who's performed at least 25 transeptal punctures and maintain that with another 25 over two year period of time. 12 of which are related to the Watchman implantation. Um, and that's something that, that really, unless you're doing a structural year or you're doing EP, um, it's probably hard for most general cardiologists to obtain. I uh, started in anticipation of, of doing these procedures. I started scrubbing in with the EP doctors and, and uh, doing a fair amount of, of transeptals with, with them. I think it's useful to consider trying to get some of that uh, training during fellowship because uh, you know, the, the structural world is growing. Um, and, but there is still a place for non-structural interventional cardiologists to do these procedures, I believe. Um, so something to, to think about as you guys tailor your, your own training goals. And finally, the facility requirements, again, a little bit um, uh, arbitrary, but the procedure must be furnished, I don't know what that means, in a hospital with an established structural heart disease or EP program. So uh, basically it's just saying, we don't want people to start these de novo. Um, there's no requirement as, that I know of for surgical backup. Um, I would strongly recommend that it be done only in hospitals with surgical backup because the risk of embolization perforation uh, is high enough that if a patient gets sick, you really wanna be able to take them to the OR quickly. All right, I'm gonna take one 
second to drink some coffee. And if there are any questions, please feel free to jump in. I feel like I've been talking continuously for about 30 to 45 minutes so far. So I'll pause there for a second. It's making me wonder if I'm like talking into the ethernet and nobody's out there at the moment. Uh, but we're out here. <laughs> I have a question, but it has to come after your indication slide. So, okay. Um, so I'm glad, glad that somebody's out there. So the indications for LA closure, this is sort of what um, we've identified locally as sort of the things that push us uh, to, to perform these procedures. And it's a little hard to, to track this in the registry, um, but there, there does seem to be some variation across sites in some of the more what I would call discretionary indications. Um, but the patients that we uh, oftentimes consider are those who have an underlying thrombocytopenia or uh, coagulopathy. Larry Young has, has referred some of the HHT patients to us, who you know, I guess really don't have a coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia, but, but certainly are at risk of recurrent bleeding. Uh, the number one referral reason we get is, is either history of a major single or multiple uh, major bleeds. Um, <clears throat> GI is number one. I'd say actually epistaxis is the second most common one that we see. I think I did not appreciate just how many times our patients on oral anticoagulation are going to the ER and getting packed, um, but I think it's a fairly traumatic experience that really incentivizes people to try and get off of anticoagulation, more so than, than bleeding in the genitourinary system, uh, system, although sometimes we are seeing that. Um, so again, one prior severe bleed is something that we will consider, um, and any intracra uh, intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, the neurologists have been fairly um, permissive in terms of, of okaying us for short-term oral anticoagulation uh, amongst patients with a variety of different types of intracranial hemorrhages. And so far, I think we've only had one or two patients um, that have had any bleeding while on anticoagulation after uh, or ICH after the implant. Um, the, the fourth one there, combined use of dual antiplatelet therapy and anticoagulant therapy. So this is the, the, the triple therapy patients. That's really disappearing quickly. Uh, there's still a couple of patients out there who received a first generation stent um, and there's reluctance to take those patients off of dual antiplatelet therapy. So we received a few patients for that. Recurrent falls is a fairly decent contributor or history of seizure disorder. Um, poor compliance or intolerance. Uh, so intolerance is, is oftentimes in the eye of the beholder, uh, but there are a few patients who just claim that they can't, they've had adverse reactions to all anticoagulant therapies. Um, and uh, so we've done a few patients like that. The compliance is one of those more ones that's more of a a discretionary uh, piece. And so we, we have shied away from that traditionally, but have done a few with that indication. What we really haven't done is just patients based on their, their underlying bleeding risk. So we, we have only done a few patients um, on the basis of never had a bleeding complication while on anti oral anticoagulation. Um, and we've never said your bleeding risk is so high that you shouldn't take it and we should have this uh, instead. And part of that uh, reflects, I think, our, our fairly conservative nature about doing these procedures and a respect for the complications that can occur with it. Um, that may change over time, particularly with the, the more favorable safety profile of the, of the flex device. And then uh, preference, I think, sort of is tied up with uh, poor compliance. Um, but there are a few patients, uh, I think most notably a, a guy who was a, uh, actually one farmer who was always working with heavy equipment and just felt like he couldn't safely do his job without while taking more lentic regulation. Um, and then a carpenter who had the same request. So we're, we are considering some of those, but again, fairly uh, limited. So Steve, do you want to ask your question now? Well, I was just, you know, the... The study, the surgical randomized trial that you mentioned that was reported recently in the New England Journal, in the uh, editorial that accompanied that, they kind of made the comment. That one of the findings of that study is that if you got left atrial appendage resection surgically and you continued anticoagulation, that was the lowest stroke risk of all. Yeah. And so do you hear any rumblings in the watchman? territories, you know, the um, 
Watchmen universe, or do you foresee a day when we'll do Watchmen's for everybody and continue their their Noack as well? Because you know, I think that was a really interesting, unexpected finding from that. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I don't know if it was play of chance or not, but but it certainly um, was fairly compelling. Um, I think there are two components that might be different um, for Watchmen versus Surgical. Um, number one. And I, I can't remember on the, in the study if they uh, mandated the way that the ligation is being performed. Um, but if you, talk, if you take a poll of, of our CT surgeons, um, each of them has a different preference for how they do it. Some prefer to over sew, some prefer to use the clip, um, and some don't believe in it at all. So, uh, so I, I, I wonder if, um, and so sometimes, particularly if you're doing the sew versus the clip, um, you leave a, a pretty good chunk of trabeculated appendage behind that can still be an itis for clot formation. In fact, we're probably gonna do a case in July of a patient who did have uh, surgical ligation but has enough of a appendage. Uh, I think they had a stroke after that and then um, can't take oral anticoagulant therapy uh, and keeps having bleeds. So we're, we're actually taking that patient to try and implant a watchman. Um, so I think that's you know one maybe technique and completeness of, of the seal. Um, but we have on a number of occasions received referrals from neurology uh, asking us to adopt the belt and suspenders approach. Uh, so for patients who are having recurrent strokes on anticoagulant therapy and, and have, you know, to the extent that we can sense been compliant with oral anticoagulation, uh, we have actually been uh, implanted a few watchmen in those patients with the intent that they will never come off oral anticoagulation. So, I don't know if it'll ever get studied. It's a great question. Um, I don't know if anyone's gonna fund that study, however. And so it may be a little bit of a challenge to get it done in a way that, that is powered adequately to, to answer the question that you're posing. Okay. Um, so oh, just a few more minutes, but I think we're wrapping up in time. Um, so as I mentioned before, there are other devices, uh, the Laird device on the left, um, the uh, cardiac occluder, the Omplots device in the middle, and then the wave crest on the right. Um, Omplots are, I believe, has been approved in Europe for three or four years now. Um, it still hasn't completed its it has completed its pivotal trial enrollment, but it won't be, hasn't been presented, I don't believe, until either September or maybe early next, uh, 2022. Um, so FDA approval is probably not going to come anytime in the, the super near future, but, but possibly sometime during 2022. I think it's um, going to be an expedited review. But from solar study data, observational data from Europe and Canada, very high comparable success rates, 97%. Um, and compared with historical controls, uh, some evidence suggesting that it provides uh, some protection compared with what their risk would be off of anticoagulation. So, you know, observational studies, nothing randomized yet. Uh, Larry, as I mentioned, is a suture-based device requiring a, um, a dry uh, pericardial access, uh, which the EP doctors are certainly used to for their uh, epicardial ablations. But uh, you're using two magnets connected through the appendage to create a rail that allows a suture to come over the appendage. Um, and then the, the suture is deployed and basically sutures off uh, the appendage. You can do this. The advantage of this device is that you can do it off of all anticoagulation other than the procedure itself. But there's no requirement for antiplatelet or anticoagulation therapy afterwards. So um, some would argue that this is a reasonable thing to consider either in patients for whom it is uh, anatomically impossible for us to implant a watchman or who can't tolerate any form of anticoagulation, um, which is generally required after the watchman device. Um, so just to talk a little bit about the flex device, we've had this since October of last year. It really is, I think, um, a game changer, although that's probably an overused phrase. Um, but for us, the big difference is that it goes from having these open feet to having these feet welded together in a um, non-pointy uh, way, right? So um, one of the, the risks that we worry about is perforation. We have sent a patient to the operating room for a, a watchman-related perforation that we could not control. 
Um, and this device seems to be associated with much lower rates of, of that occurrence. And it's because it's atraumatic. It also requires less depth. So it allows us to treat a larger number of patients, patients who wouldn't have been eligible for the initial 2.5 device. We can now offer the Watchman Flex device. <clears throat> One of the differences of concerns is that you don't get quite as good apposition as deep into the appendage. And so the security of the device is a concern. And there are reports that there are more embolizations. And we had our first embolization uh, two weeks ago, which was uh, traumatic for everybody. Uh, the patient did well after surgical retrieval. Um, but there are two lines of barbs, and we really need to be very attuned to the compression of the device, um, as well as to making sure that it's as well anchored as we think it is. But you can see the automatic um, visual appeal of the device. So on the left is sort of the 2.5 device, where you've got these feet that you're not pushing in, but, but unsheathing in the uh, appendage but they are pointy and can perforate quite easily. We compare that to where the feet are welded together. Again, it's a very smooth uh, atraumatic surface and it allows us a lot more guide manipulation options to get a good, a good release. And in the, the single arm study, the Pinnacle Flex device uh, study, relatively small number of patients, I think 400, um, but the risk of, of uh, major um, bleeding and pericardial effusion was uh, relatively low and nobody had to go to surgery. So I'm gonna spend the last two minutes here uh, just talking a little bit about the, the registry. So as I mentioned, it's mandated by CMS and it serves as the mechanism for post-market FDA surveillance studies. Um, Jim and I am a, uh, Jim is the PI and I'm a co-investigator on the Safely AF grant, which is leveraging the data that's being collected for the registry to basically conduct some real world evidence assessment of this novel approach. Um, and ideally using our results to refine risk prediction to better inform that shared decision-making that CMS mandated and comparative effectiveness research. So um, a couple of, of just one-off thoughts here based on the data. Um, so the number of sites and the number of procedures, the number of operators has increased dramatically over time. And again, this is data through about three years ago. It's only continued to increase. I think we're up to about 650 implanting sites now. Um, compared with the clinical trials, uh, the, the US population getting this device are older and more frail and fragile. Um, and have a, a tremendous large number of, of prior bleeds. So about 70% of the patients getting watchman device in the U.S. have a history of a clinically relevant bleed in the past. And that is in direct contrast to the patients who were enrolled in clinical trials. Um, they tend to be fairly high risk. Chad's two best median score, I believe, was 4.5 or so, and the has bled uh, was about three. So they are at high risk of both bleeding and from robotic events. Um, volume was relatively small at sites, although this does represent relatively early experience and sites were still coming on board. Um, but I think probably the median is still probably only about 50 sites in, in more recent data. Uh, procedural success, as I mentioned, 98% in the overall registry. And uh, this is probably the key slide is that in clinical practice, albeit this is self-reported data, the risk of any major complication was about 2%. Uh, the risk of any stroke related to the procedure was very low, about 0.17%. The risk of major bleeding, about 1.25%. And the risk of, of uh, major vascular complication, about 0.15%. Um, and just to tease with one of the uh, comparative effectiveness studies that we did, um, one of the things we wanted to look at is what are the strategies that we're using for anticoagulation antiplatelet therapy after the device in up to 45 days, and what is the association of with that strategy with outcomes? Um, so by mandate, the FDA approval, it was supposed to be warfarin and aspirin, and that's the most commonly used combination, um, but there's a lot of variation in, in our approach. We never use the warfarin and aspirin. We would only use DOAC or warfarin only. We had actually early on uh, abandoned aspirin. Um, and the data would support that, that we guessed right in that in the unadjusted and adjusted analyses, um, compared with warfarin plus aspirin, warfarin alone or DOAC alone had lower rates of, of any adverse events and warfarin alone and a trend for DOAC alone had a risk of lower major adverse events. So uh, no difference in strokes. So that sort of highlights a little bit about what we can do with this data now that 
um, you're collecting it nationally and get some real world evidence around its, its use in the United States. So I'm going to just finish with one, one plea here. Um, so I mentioned that there hadn't been any comparison of the Watchman device versus uh, modern anticoagulation strategy with NOAC or DOAC. Um, so we are enrolling now in the, the Champion AF trial, randomized trial at 200 sites uh, to Watchman Flex versus a DOAC. Um, patients really don't need to have had a, a prior bleed. They just need to have some risk of a thromboembolic stroke, need to be eligible for long-term anticoagulation, and they need to be interested in a one-time procedure designed to reduce the need for anticoagulation. Uh, the follow-up will be median of, of, of uh, three years, but up to 60 months. And the primary endpoint is non-inferiority for cardiovascular death, stroke, or systemic embolism. And the second primary endpoint is superiority for Watchmen over DOAC for non-procedural bleeding. And I think this study um, will be successful. I hope it's successful locally, and I'm happy to talk to any of you guys about patients that you may have that, that could be interested in enrolling in this study. But I think this will really define whether or not the Watchman or left atrial appendage occlusion writ large remains sort of a niche product for those who can't take oral anticoagulation versus really equivalent standard of care for patients at high risk of thromboembolic protection here, but who could take long-term anticoagulation. So um, it's an important study, I think, for those reasons. So in conclusion, and one minute over, sorry, uh, among patients with AF, uh, antithrombotic therapies at this point remain the standard of care, but in that 40% of eligible patients who are not on appropriate therapy, I think it's reasonable to consider the Watchman device, which is a reasonably safe, effective alternative to anticoagulation, uh, but does importantly require short-term antithrombotic and antiplatelet therapy. So thanks for your attention and uh, hope I don't have to talk the rest of the day. Thanks, Jeff. This is Steve. Thanks a lot. That was uh, really interesting. Um, if I ask you to talk next year, can you just talk about the uh, registry though? Because I think that's really interesting stuff. That data, you know, um, more more registry, less less science. Or science. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can do that. I can that was endlessly about registries. That was a little tease at the end. It seemed so. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. That was great. Really enjoyed it. I appreciate you coming on on your long uh, Zoom day. All right. Thanks so much. Take care.